Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, it is my great pleasure to have as a guest Richard Falk. Richard Falk is Albert G. Milbank, Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton University and currently Chair of Global Law, Queen Mary University, London. Falk served as UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Occupied Palestine, 2008 to 2014. He's written many books. Reimagining Humane Global Governance 2014 proposes a value-oriented assessment of world order and future trends. Among his earlier writings are Legal Order in a Violent World and This Endangered Planet, Prospects and Proposals for Human Survival. His most recent publications are Power Shift 2017, Revisiting the Vietnam War 2017, on nuclear weapons denuclearization demilitarization and disarmament 2019 and since 2009 falk has been annually nominated for the nobel peace prize his political memoir public intellectual life of a citizen pilgrim was published by clarity press in february of this year his website is at richardfalk.org richard falk welcome to talk world radio thank you david i'm glad to be with you uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad our technology seems to be working. You're speaking from Turkey, is that correct? Yes, from southern Turkey. Um, this this book, uh, your new memoir, Public Intellectual, is is remarkable. You you were born in 1930 and have about 90 years of wisdom packed hmm. into this book. Uh, can you talk a little bit about about your childhood? You you write that you were unaware that a life of public service might be an option and you were not decided very early on what direction to take in life. Uh, yes, that puts it, uh, that's really an understatement. I was, uh, <laughs> I had a sort of troubled childhood, um, a broken family uh, situation, a sister that had great mental difficulties. And I seemed surrounded by uh, other kids my age who had very normal lives, and so that accentuated my sense of uh, difference, I guess. And um, I early on um, uh, distinguished between my, my mother's family was very successful uh, economically, and my father's family was not so successful, but they were much nicer. And I somehow transposed that into an identification with uh, vulnerable and marginalized people. And it sort of uh, activated later on in political terms, particularly my uh, experience of the Vietnam War and going to North Vietnam in a sort of peace-oriented uh, capacity in 1968 and sensing the war from the perspective of the victims. Uh, the Vietnamese society was totally vulnerable to the high technology uh, weaponry that the United States was using on a large scale. And I was very affected by that and by the quality of the society and the culture of Vietnam. And I thought this was a a collective atrocity, so to speak, but, and it affect. I had gone to Vietnam as an opponent of the war, but in a sort of intellectual mode, as a, it seemed to me to be an imprudent exercise of uh, power and uh, not serving the national interests of the country, a sort of modified liberal realist uh, way of looking at the world. But I came back much more engaged in the struggle of the Vietnamese people for their own future and for the ethos of self-determination. And that was very transformative for me. And, and you were, uh, we we're skipping over hundreds of pages here of, <laughs> of your development, but you were a, a professor at Princeton before you were a political activist of any sort, right? And this developed during the, the, the war on Vietnam period. 
Uh, yes, there's no doubt that I never would have been a professor at Princeton had I earlier become a political activist. The gatekeepers didn't do a good job with me. And, um, and as events unfolded, it w once you're inside the gates, it's harder to expel you. Uh, but the, it's easy to keep people out of the enclosure, these privileged enclosures. Uh, yes. But I've, uh, I found that um, it was advantageous in certain ways to be at Princeton from a political point of view because it gave me a kind of credibility I probably didn't deserve and uh, allowed me to... Uh, have access to mainstream media to, to a greater extent than would have been the case otherwise, and to testify in Congress and do all those kind of mainstream things. Uh, so there was, there was not much of a tension uh, around my uh, political view, my early political views uh, until I touched on Israel-Palestine and, to some extent, Iran, which preceded uh, Israel-Palestine. But there was a lot of tension around my uh, scholarly interest in opposing war and, op and favoring international law. In other words, there was more of a... I was more m marginal as a result of my... Uh, intellectual style than my political views. And that's often not understood by people uh, that uh, a university like Princeton is epistemologically very conservative and it's politically quite liberal. And, and uh, so you're, you're punished in a way for doing academic work that isn't in the mainstream. And my departure from the mainstream was to be explicitly normative. You, instead of uh, following the precepts of realism, uh, I wanted a better world, a world that was more peaceful and more just. And I oriented my uh, work from the beginning in those directions and that had a lot to do with my eventual uh, carrying that into the streets so to speak by becoming an activist which is another uh, taboo with you're allowed to be an activist with elites but not with people uh, in other words you're it's it's considered a positive credential to be invited to uh, consult with the CIA or the, the government in any capacity or a large corporation or Wall Street, uh, but it's considered n a, a negative credential if you talk at a demonstration or teach in or do those things that are not becoming of a Princeton professor. You write, Richard Falk, in the book that it was around the time that you took a trip to Vietnam and you began describing the war as a criminal act that you became marginalized and unacceptable. And yet, a few pages later, you write about all the media attention on your return to France from Vietnam. And a few pages later, huge media attention around your, your book on the... Uh, the the uh, endangered planet the uh, this endangered planet uh, it, I mean it, it it seems the media didn't quite uh, shut you out and the State Department didn't quite shut you out immediately anyway. <laughs> well the, the uh, maybe I didn't explain it uh, chronologically very well because I didn't emphasize the criminal dimension of the war till uh, rather late m much later than uh, Vietnam. Uh, than my trip to Vietnam and uh, later than this endangered planet. And w uh, it, oddly enough, uh, I had a series of, uh, I wouldn't call them debates, but uh, joint programs with Telford Taylor, who was the 
uh, Ameri American pro one of the American prosecutors at Nuremberg and the great expert on Nuremberg. And he took the, the position in these discussions we had uh, that Vietnam was a mistake, not a crime. And I took a position that it was a crime as well as a mistake. And, and it was then that I violated the taboo, uh, which as long as you debated the uh, the, the prudence of the decision, you were within uh, acceptable boundaries. But if you questioned oh, the uh, moral, moral and legal probity of the decision and the policy, then you were uh, out of bounds. Does that seem to be exactly the same today, or was I right in understanding that you were suggesting uh, perhaps greater openness to debate and and other viewpoints in U.S. society uh, 50 years ago than now? Uh, yeah, I think that's particularly true in Washington. In other words, uh, someone with my kind of views is completely unwelcome in Washington and uh, seen as outside the boundaries of responsible and acceptable uh, debate. Uh, that's not true in academic settings, the, uh, and especially among students. Uh, there's a lot of receptivity to uh, my ways of thinking. and. Uh, uh, when I left Princeton and went to Santa Barbara, I found students uh, on the West Coast very receptive to uh, more progressive thinking on central uh, issues of uh, global justice. When you, when you write about uh, your book, This Endangered Planet, I was very interested in your remarks about how less acceptable it was to to be including militarism uh, and the need for global cooperation in a, in a book about environmental issues. And it seems that's been going on for at least half a century. You still can't get environmental groups, uh, the big ones, to touch militarism. Is, has this been constant? Uh, I think it has, it, and, and I've had several experiences that I didn't write about, I guess. Uh, I tried to, I was on this commission, International Commission on the Oceans, the Future of the Oceans, and I tried to extend it to cover naval operations and uh, practically uh, ended the commission, and American admirals made trips, the chair of the... Uh, commission was Mario Suarez, the former president of Portugal. And uh, he was a kind of social democrat and uh, went along with my ideas on, on uh, extending the coverage to uh, na naval operations, though he backed down somewhat when this pressure came from U.S. Navy. and. Uh, they, and, and there was a congressman, actually he was one of the Kennedys, uh, Patrick Kennedy was on the commission, and he uh, was uh, to extremely hostile in his response to my uh, suggestions. And he, I think, identified with the Navy, maybe he had been a naval uh, officer or some, something. But yeah. it, it, was, it was, again, a reminder that uh, naval operation, you know, they were kept out of the Paris Agreement, for, which is on climate change. Uh, and Kyoto. And Kyoto. Well, Paris is much more important than Kyoto, but uh, in, 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 as you say, it's a consistent pattern, and it's something that hasn't been remarked on so much. And our conversation makes me think maybe I've been negligent not calling more attention. To, I've thought about it a lot, but I've never written very much about it. Well, that you've written some about it for 50 years or so is, uh, <laughs> is certainly a contribution. Was it, was it maybe in the context of that commission that you traveled to South Africa? Um, I, I, I'm not sure I may have that mixed up, but I wonder if you could tell 
people about uh, writing a speech for Nelson Mandela and then having to reply to his speech, uh, <laughs> which you had written. Uh, it seems a very interesting experience. <laughs> yes, it was a nerve-wracking experience in some ways, but uh, because I had given, I had written the uh, speech for Mandela uh, first, and the on the this was in connection with the Oceans Commission, which met uh, in different countries, and this time met in uh, Cape Town in South Africa, and. One of the vice chairs of the commission was a South African, and he had been asked by Mandela to write the speech, and he in turn asked me to write it, uh, which I did. And I, uh, but I gave all the good line, all the good language I could think of to him, and then I had uh, the the response was supposed to be given by a Brazilian vice chair of the commission who got sick at the last moment. And so Suarez uh, prevailed on me to try to respond to Mandela, which I was proud to do in one way, but uh, uh, humbled in another. And uh, I, could, I, I had a sleepless night. And I think I say in the memoir, in any event it is true, that in, in the recep after the reception, or in the reception after the event, I actually fainted for the first and only time in my life. Uh, I, and I sort of, I guess, internalized the tension. Uh, but Mandela was a, it was a great joy to meet him, an honor, of course. And he was very impressive. He went, uh, he spoke to every member of our commission, which was about 40, 40 or 45 people. And uh, he, um, he had a moral radiance that very few people I've ever met uh, exhibited. And, uh, often when you meet these ce celebrated people, they're dis it's a disappointment. But in his case, it was a validation of all that he embodied. In, in the book, Richard, you, you write uh, favorably about Fidel Castro, Ho Chi Minh, and the weather underground uh, in the space of just a few pages. Uh, what was and what is your thinking? This may be too complex a question for, for a couple of minutes here, but what is, what is your thinking about the use of violence? Uh, well, I feel uh, I'm, I, I don't like it. Uh, I mean, I, I have uh, written sort of extensively about uh, a nonviolent geopolitics and about um, transformation of global militarism and so on. At the same time, for when people are living under sustained repression, I don't feel uh, morally capable of judging them if they, rec if they have recourse to uh, violence and limit that recourse to uh, appropriate targets. I mean, it's, it's an uncomfortable position for me, but, but I, uh, in other words, I don't adopt a, a, a rigorous Gandhian uh, ethos of nonviolence. Uh, on the other hand, I don't endorse violence. Uh, I, I, w I feel personally uh, more responsive to nonviolent thinking as uh, personified by Gandhi and Martin Luther King, Tolstoy, and so on. But uh, I I've been sufficiently connected with uh, liberation movements and struggles that people have against violence, against greater violence, the violence of resistance. Uh, and I, I don't feel uh, morally capable of judging them for recourse to violence. 
Well, without uh, without proposing the judgment of anyone or the announcement of superiority to anyone or anything remotely of the sort, um, when I look at you know studies by Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan and others suggesting that nonviolence is usually more likely to succeed. Uh, if someone asks my advice, even someone living in a country being bombed by the government that is supposedly my government, uh, I, I, I give them my honest advice. Uh, what seems more likely to succeed and what seems less likely to succeed? I don't, I, I don't consider that unfair judging, and I certainly don't uh, think it suggests that I'm in any way better than anyone else. Um, does that... Does that seem reasonable or not? Uh, well, it's, it's a departure from my uh, way of thinking. I, I, I knew Gene Sharp uh, somewhat, and he took yeah. that position uh, that you articulated, but it led him into uh, advising the Pentagon and doing all kinds of things uh, that I felt were aiming at bad outcomes. And well, nonviolence can be put to evil ends, uh, but I wouldn't imagine you think violence can't be put to evil oh, no, ends. Of course, no, of course, it, 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 it wasn't the decisive consideration, but it made me think about, and uh, the, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I've judged from the, my recent years, my involvement with the Palestinian struggle has led me to think that um, uh, I don't know what would work, but uh, I don't want to put myself in the position of telling the Palestinians what to do or uh, giving advice where I don't take the risks that that adv advice entails. If uh, I tend to agree with you that in many instances it would seem that nonviolence has uh, a practical justification as well as a principled justification. But in some instances I don't think that is, tr that is so true. I mean with uh, the, the fate of Native peoples probably would have been the same had they been violent, but uh, uh, and they were to some extent uh, violent. But but I don't think that uh, I had conversations in New Zealand with the Maori uh, native people, and they said um, they said what I remember asking them why they their uh, outcome was different than the Australian Aboriginal peoples. And they said, we, we were like the Vietnamese. They never defeated us militarily. We retreated to the mountains and therefore we have maintained the uh, integrity of our traditions. Now that can be interrogated, that, uh, that uh, view of both Vietnam and of uh, New Zealand, but that it, it made a, it, it strengthened my sense of uh, what shall I say, uh, listening rather than telling. Uh, see, I, I'm also sensitive because I've been in these international situations that Americans go around the world telling others what to do about their uh, uh, conflicts and their future. And I uh, reacted somewhat against that. I don't know if I discussed, you know, Ramsey Clark went with me to Iran and he had a, I liked him, admired him very much, but he had a tendency to do that, to sort of lecture the Iranians on what they should do in, in terms of governance and in terms of tactics and they, they, in fact, were uh, pursuing a nonviolent uh, revolutionary uh, strategy, by and large. Uh, and the, I, somehow I felt uncomfortable with that, taking that kind of position. Yes, 
Well, I, I respect and appreciate all of that. I, I, I just think the question of what advice you should give if asked is a separate question from whether you should give advice when you're not asked, which obviously yeah, you should not. <laughs> um, uh, um, it, it, we're speaking with Richard Falk, uh, and uh, I, I, I just find it uh, incredibly valuable uh, how much you advance the idea of international law uh, and yet we still have so far to go. I mean, has Washington, D.C. ever, ever shared your interest in respecting international law? Well, again, I think there's been a uh, decline in that respect from the point where, where I graduated from law school. I think at that time uh, there was the idea that international law can be interpreted in ways that are not incompatible with the pursuit of national interests. So it was manipulated to some extent, but it was taken seriously, at least on a rhetorical level. And in the Vietnam right. context, it was the last, the one and only time that the U.S. tried to make a concerted and coherent legal defense of its interventionary policies. Uh, after that, a much more uh, cynical view toward international law emerged in these peace and security contexts. And then with the 9-11 attacks, there, w there was the feeling that international law was geared to another era of conflict and warfare and that it no longer fit the uh, realities of military necessity and uh, therefore it could be, uh, it was justifiable to ignore it. And George W. Bush, you know, invented some language to get around, uh, sort of to give a thin veneer of rationalization. He talked about enhanced interrogation rather than torture. and. Uh, use euphemisms of that sort, uh, and even more blatantly said that uh, those who are combatants uh, as designated terrorists are not, cannot, will not be treated as prisoners of war and will not be uh, given the benefits of international humanitarian law. And Israel has done the same thing uh, throughout its uh, struggle with Palestinians. Yes, indeed. Uh, we've been speaking with Richard Falk. I wish we could go on for hours, uh, but we are out of time. The, the book, which you should pick up right away, as well as all of his other books, is <laughs> Public Intellectual, Life of a Citizen Pilgrim. Richard Falk's website is at richardfalk.org. Richard, thank you very, very much for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David, for having me. And I'm sorry we never got to talk about drones. I should have accepted your invitation to, because I've read your recent uh, uh, kind of essay on, on the drone anti-drone campaign, which I share. I agree with. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.